This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you all for joining us today. With me today, I've got John Cameron in the middle and our special guest over there at the end, Nicholas Wildstar. Nicholas, thank you for joining us today. We've got two bits of information for you to start with today. You are on the campaign trail for governor again, if if memory has me correct. That's where I know you from. I was at the rally in <laughs> Oakland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. You remember now. Short yeah, bald guy. Yeah. Yeah. And you are also part of. Long time no see. Yeah, and you are also part of the recall effort. So if you can take us thirty seconds to give everybody where they can go find some information about these things. Absolutely. Well, yes, as uh, James just so handsomely put it, I am running for governor of California in 2022. Uh, I was the 2018 libertarian candidate. I look a bit different, but uh, still am the same God through and through. <laughs> and I'm offering to do the same thing as far as, you know, reducing the size of government and the amount of taxes that we're paying here in the state, improving our homeless situation. Uh, so if you would like to find out more about what I've been uh, or what I would like to do for the state, definitely visit my website, wildstar2022.com. And I've also been pounding the pavement uh, since the beginning of March, I would say. Yeah. Um, to recall Gavin Newsom uh, due to his failures as governor of the state, not only before the lockdown, but during of which. Um, so there's tons of information and out there about him and uh, his failures um, as an elected representative. So I've been out there um, collecting signatures, meeting hundreds of people and talking to them about how these lockdowns have um, have pretty much interrupted their lives. Uh, so if more people out there would like to find out more about the recall effort, definitely visit recallgavin2020.com. And uh, on that website, the petition is available. So uh, do as you choose as far as informing others. All right. Well, let's hop right in there talking about the incompetence of our state. The EDD scam has kind of get full into light where they have, we've got prisoners who have somehow managed to get billions of dollars or people getting money in their name, I guess. I guess Scott Peterson's lawyers came out and said he didn't do it. Someone was doing it in his name. But well, how in the heck this even happens is kind of a mess. Then you've got the whole Bank of America EDD debit cards are, are scamming. People, yeah. have lost, people have lost all their ED, their unemployment benefits to scammers because they wouldn't put this, the chip that they mandate for everybody else on the cards that the government gives to unemployment workers. So this whole EDD scam has become, has exposed that this decades long problem with EDD. Um, John, I know you have a, an opinion on this one. An, an opinion? No, I got an opinion on stuff I've never even heard of. So I got an opinion <laughs> on this. So uh, before the California uh, information came out about uh, they could be upwards of a billion dollars. If they're saying they've, they've identified, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, 150 million or so, and they are looking at it thinking it's going to be about a billion. And if it's about a billion, it means it's probably 10 times that. Um, the, the EDD has been a disaster from day one. They have had uh, the same incompetent uh, external um, data folks involved with trying to get their, their programs up to the late 1980s, much less into 2020. For the last 30 years, they've thrown hundreds of millions of dollars at their computer system. And, mm -hmm. and if, you've ever, if you've ever had the, the misfortune to deal with them, I think the people that work there actually do care. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of volunteers. I'm a vet, so uh, I know there's programs for veterans. There's a lot of rehabilitation stuff, and I think they actually care. The problem is, like anything else, it's a, it's a government program, and I label those as one size fits none, not one size fits all or one size fits some, one size fits none. And, and what they do is they, they've made it very hard, nigh on impossible, for people who really need the money to be able to, to, I think it's 
take somewhere between eight and 13 weeks, correct me if I'm wrong, for somebody to get money under this, this Neanderthal of a system, but that's actually uh, denigrating Neanderthals. Yet um, people in prison can, can uh, get paid. I think there was one person that got paid under 23 different names outside of prison using prisoners' names. They're getting dead people paid. Um, and, and the national organizations looked at fraud and they said early in the game, and I think this was in April or May, that more fraud, there have been more unemployment fraud paid out, fraudulent claims in, in 2020 than all of the unemployment claims paid out in 2019. So you look at, you know, you throw around this billion dollar number like it's nothing. But um, I think a little later we're going to talk about uh, the, the unintended consequences or the other consequences of what's going on with this. I call it the panic-demic. I don't call it the, uh, a pandemic. It's a panic-demic mm -hmm. because the, the lunatics who put themselves in charge or created more problems than they fixed with the stupid policies they've got. So panic-demic. We're going to talk about that. But this is just one more example. And I think there's hope. Uh, Nick, Nicholas, and I were talking before the show about getting the word out, and I said, I think it's falling on deaf ears, and that's not true. I'm talking to people who are dyed in the wool liberals, and I hate that term because they're not liberals, they're socialists. There's nothing liberal about them in their thinking or anything else, um, who are, are leaning toward, they won't label themselves this because their, their, their parents would roll in their graves, libertarian thought, because they're seeing how horrible any government quote unquote solution is to a problem. And, and so this is, this is maybe one of these days there's going to be the straw that breaks the inefficient, oversized, horribly designed government back. It's just going to come crashing down. And I think, you know, if, it, if it's only paying out a billion dollars in California and fraudulent claims that, that, that gets people thinking about how stupid government solutions are to made up problems, um, then, then that'll be a wonderful thing. I could go on all show, but other people need to talk. So, yeah. <laughs> so what about you, Nicholas? How are we going to deal with this EDD mess? It's been a problem for decades now. The, the inability for the government to upgrade their systems, just that basic fact right there. How do we actually solve these problems? Well, my proposal as a candidate for governor is to just disband the entire EDD and put the um, the benefit of people receiving unemployment back into employers' hands. I think they should be responsible for it instead of the government. That would also reduce the amount of liability on government officials' shoulders to have to deal with the issue. I mean, think about it. If you had an employer that offered um, unemployment as a benefit to potential employees, that would make them more attractive than any other competitor for that service or product or whatever the case may be. And it would be an idea that would catch on and more employers would start to offer it as well. Versus now what we have is a collection of our tax dollars and it being re redistributed by the uh, state government um, to now, people who don't even need it, you know? <laughs> um, and I just actually think it also proves more of government's incompetency when it comes to them actually dealing with a crisis, dealing with a, a, a need for the public um, and addressing it in an efficient manner. I mean, um, not only is the EDD a failure and has proven to be fraudulent and it's and it's um just in its existence, but so does the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. I mean, what government <laughs> yeah. works well, right? <laughs> and at least the people at EDD are happy to help you. You go to the DMV, you know, they have an attitude, and I, I've even had to call um, this clerk's office to request a copy of. Uh, my son's birth certificate, and they were extremely rude. They made it seem like, you know, it was a privilege for me to even be speaking with them. And I'm like, wait a minute, I pay your salary with, you know, with my tax dollars. And I think that's all being um, 
taken for granted right now, especially with the lockdown and people being rendered non-essential and not being able to work and provide a living for themselves. So if we want to get back things back the way they were and give we the people the upper hand again, then we got to let them know that they work for us, not the way or other way around. And the best way to do that is just get rid of these government um, entities that's uh, that have proven to be ineffective, that have proven to be incompetent and find a different alternative. I want to give our, our average, uh, worker, the average bureaucrat, a bit of a, a lifeline here. It's not their fault. You can actually take the DMV or EDD or any of these programs. And if they had kept their original mission, kept it like small and focused, they could actually accomplish their goals. But mission right. creep, especially with the DMV, mission creep has made the DMV an absolute disaster. And yeah. I think that's that's on the fault of the politicians. And I don't think I want to make sure we're clear here that we're not blaming the, the bureaucrats. They're just people who've been hired to do a job and they've been thrown under the bus by these politicians. But speaking of getting thrown under the bus by the politicians, Gavin Newsom back here on a Saturday, Small Business Saturday, he encouraged people to get out and <laughs> to get out and shop at small businesses when he's closed half of them. Right. <laughs> How can you even coin it Small Business Saturday when you're to blame for it, you know? <laughs> But it, it just proves how out of touch uh, these politicians are and these representatives and actually knowing what what they're doing, um, because you just said it right. He's implemented this lockdown, which has severely affected the small businesses because they can't compete with the larger ones and making sure that they're able to cover payroll. Uh, many of them have been uh, ineligible and deemed ineligible to receive uh, these payroll protection program loans, triple P loans, that Governor Gavin Newsom received himself for his Plump Jack Winery, which has never been closed during this shutdown. He has restaurants as well. He has businesses that has never been shut down and have received, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayers money via these loans that should have went towards these small businesses for so for him to send out a tweet to everyone especially after when he's also imposed the lockdown to say uh don't go out and do anything non-essential uh to also turn around and say go out and <laughs> go shopping yeah. Don't go visit grandma, but go shopping. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm. I think a, a fee. One of my favorite organizations, Foundations for Economic Education. Um, I think uh, has pulled a number up and said something like a third of the small businesses in this country aren't going to survive this thing. Right. Um, and I don't know if it's that bad, but it, it feels like it. And um, you know, it, it's it's. You would think small small business, not not well medium sized businesses, but small businesses become medium sized businesses, and they are the 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 labor driver, the job driver, uh, the economy driver for this country. Uh, there is no argument against that. Any any economist, Keynesian, uh, um, Chicago school, anybody will look at the numbers and say. The, the people that, that drive the economy, that provide all the jobs, the capital, especially for entry-level workers, for people who are lower on the skill ratio, they provide a job for them. They provide um, um, money to their local community by the, by the wealth they create through their hard work. Strange concept in this country now, created wealth. Um, and, and those businesses become medium-sized businesses and all the rest. The reason that they were punished in this is because what they don't do is spend a lot of money lobbying and they don't give a lot of money to government candidates except right. as individuals. So, you know, if anybody in this country needs to band together um, and, and there are all sorts of organizations out there, but they're not effective. It is small businesses, uh, you know, independent small businesses, even franchisees, um, and all the rest of those people that, that really have between zero or one employee and 20 or 30 or 50 or whenever the, 
the red tape starts to bog you down, which is, I think, in California at one, but uh, literally it's at about 50, need to band together and keep these people from destroying them. Because the only people that benefit uh, from the loss of a small business are bigger businesses who have their, their the government's hands in their pockets, especially ones that have unions. And typically small businesses are not unionized. As a matter of fact, I think 95% of them aren't. And that's a, that's, that's a sin to the, to the unions, which basically pay for, you know, having their politicians put in power to protect them. So uh, this, this idea that, that Gavin Newsom, who's, who has a small business himself, has created these programs that, that benefit uh, people. I mean, if you're running a small business, if you've got a mechanic, you've got two mechanics and you've got somebody running the books, you need to hire another person just to fill out the government forms to keep you from being closed because of environmental concerns. How in the heck are you going to have somebody qualified to go through the mass of paperwork necessary to even get one of these loans if you qualify? Mm -hmm. And let's say, let's say you had one coffee shop last year. And this year, in February, because of you were doing so well, you opened a second one. And you created about 13 jobs doing that. It's just a little coffee shop. you got a lot of shifts. you got a manager, all the rest of that. If you went and asked these people for one of these payroll pr protection plan loans, they would base that loan not on what you're, you're doing in February, but what your tax receipts were last year. So basically, you've created wealth, you've created these jobs, and when you go to ask to keep the second business open and pay these people, the answer is, oh, no, 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 you, you only have half those employees because we're looking at your numbers from last year. So this is just crazy. It's, it's another example of the one-size-fits-none business or, or, or government uh, solution to a problem that they created. So, yeah, well, don't forget that. I may have to <laughs> Yeah, I think you're going to steal it. I already, I feel that already, and you have my permission. All but right. If you that. used, if you use the word panic demic, or <laughs> one size fits none, gotta give me credit. You got it, buddy. <laughs> Just say my libertarian leaning friend, my 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 libertarian leaning libertarian friend John. <laughs> Use a couple of phrases I really like, and here they are, and then just yeah, sell the hell out of it. You got it. You got it. Don't well, catch on. Well, remember, guys, California also has AB5 where they've assault on gig workers. And there's nothing yeah. smaller a business than an individual gig worker who's yeah. trying to create himself just out of pure hustle. Mm -hmm. And yet California has they've, they've, uh, essentially assaulted those workers, those people who want to just work on their own. And so this is just yet another example of how California politicians are just completely disconnected from the average really, I, 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 I kind of I, I agree that it looks like they're disconnected but but they're they're only disconnected if you assume that their stated goal is their real goal right and their stated goal is they're never their real goal their stated goal first is to maintain and increase their own personal power right the second goal of anybody in government is to increase uh, tax revenues so that they can do the first goal which is to maintain and increase their power and the third role is to increase uh, union representation by forcing people to join unions so that they get the, the money that the unions give them to maintain and increase their power. So the fourth goal might be helping people out. But, but you know, if you could give those people sodium pentothal, they tell you they, they don't care a, a lick about what happens to gig workers. They just want more tax revenue, um, exactly. more union members, which will turn into more uh, more employees under their thumb in whatever department they work for, and more political donations come re-election time. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're not they're not out of step. They're just lying. They're lying about what their goals are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they flat out just said it was socialized employment that they're aiming to do, yeah. more people would be... Um, protesting against it. But that's exactly what we have here is government creating this one size fits none policy with AB5. Like it rolls right off your tongue. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Prop 22 just popped the hole in that by proving how dysfunctional it is to where you had, you know, Uber and Lyft spend over a hundred million dollars, you know, one of the um, most expensive promoted propositions in the state of California just so they could give 
uh, ride share drivers an opportunity to remove <laughs> from the contractors, but everybody else is screwed. M mechanics, roofers, electricians, um, you know, gardeners, journalists. Yeah. Journalists. Oh, and some of the fixes are just are worse than the AB5 because now you've got to hire a team of lawyers to figure out whether you comply or don't. It's, it's exactly. awful. But we're going to move on, Nicholas, because I want to talk to you about you've been the one hitting the streets, talking to people. Um, the consequences of the lockdown is we have more and more people on unemployment. And so what they call food insecurity is increasing. Have you been seeing that as you've been kind of traversing the state? Um, not necessarily. The the belly aching seems to be more so that people want to just be able to live their lives as they did before the lockdown. They want to be able to meet with friends and family. They want to be able to go out and work um, and not be told that their line of work is not essential. Therefore, they are deemed, you know, um, to just be someone to sit home and continue collecting this government UBI or whatever it is they want to create, um, which isn't efficient, uh, which isn't sufficient itself, because it isn't providing enough for people for them to not be threatened with eviction, to them not being threatened with losses of food, like you said, and um, adequate child care. You have a lot of parents out there that are now forced to homeschool their children. It's brand to new to them. It's a concept that they weren't prepared for. And now they're having to take on this new responsibility to educate their children at home. And um, it's frustrating them. And, and as well as with them also having to work and, you know, um, keep a roof over their heads and provide for their family. So that's the biggest complaint that I've come across is just people feeling frustrated because they're having to now juggle so many things just to live and live comfortably. So um, uh, thankfully you have a lot of people of the community reaching out to help each other when it comes to food shortages. You have food banks local community food banks where people are making um you know making meals readily available especially to the children that are not able to go to school and receive uh you know any meals uh while they're in school so uh you got a lot of neighborhood meals on wheels programs popping up but also you have government um, cracking down on them, saying, well, since you're not approved or licensed or authorized to do so, you're not going to be able to provide this assistance to people in the community. So it really ties our hands as far as us helping each other and more so having to rely on government. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that this whole thing would kind of break our reliance on the school system. We've actually asked our schools to do much more than educate our kids. Right. That maybe we can actually get them back to, you know, just educating our kids and we can actually kind of break that cycle. But it actually doesn't look like that's going to happen. It looks like we're going to get these schools are going to actually ask to do more. Again, we get this whole mission creep thing and they're not going to do it well. And so it, it's frustrating because, you know, there is an opportunity here to look at and do something different and we're just not going to do it. Exactly. Well, I, 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 it seems like I've disagreed with you twice already to end the show, James. I'm sorry. I don't necessarily want to do that. But I think uh, I'm talking to people who are, are finally starting to see some of the chinks in this uh, propaganda arm that's called the California Teachers Association, mm -hmm. who've convinced they've dumbed down students so far and dumbed down their parents so far in previous generations, they actually believe this, this crap about students being underpaid. And, and if you do the math, they're actually getting paid pretty well for working nine months out of the year. And then you put in the fact that they can retire at age 60 with a $70,000 pension. That means two teachers in retirement at age 60 who whined their whole time they were working about how poorly they were paid, now in retirement have $140,000 to travel with. And every time I go on a trip to a foreign country or on a cruise or anything, you know who's on that cruise with me or who's staying in that hotel? These poor teachers because their, their, um, their hobby is international travel. And I'm wondering, I don't know a whole lot of poor people. Do, do you um, know a lot of poor people whose hobby is international travel? 
But apparently these poor teachers can do international travel. So that's one chink in the armor, which is wonderful. And the other is that these people who are homeschooling are seeing that their kids are getting a better education, turned loose themselves on parent supervised programs on the internet that they had to come up with on their own because they were handed crap by the school district if they got anything with an, about an hour or two's work with their parents are making more progress than they were making stuck in the propaganda prison, which is a public school. And there in that public school, they don't have to worry. They, when kids are at home, they don't have to worry about them getting bullied. They can, they can have control over who they associate with. They can make sure they're, they're not being propagandized and all the rest of that. You're going to see a lot of pressure on what people call public school. I call government school, which are basically, you know, again, just money machines for teachers unions. So they can vote in popula- in politicians to keep them from having any competition. I mean, if you were to ask and, and uh, Nicholas, you're, you talk to people, I think more face to face than I do. Um, it's my understanding from looking at the numbers, that the people in this country who really want school vouchers aren't rich white people, because rich white people are already sending their kids to private schools. It is poor people of color who want to take the money that is being wasted on these horrible schools that are forced to send their kids to and send them someplace better. Is that what you're hearing? You're absolutely right. Um, Many of them are seeing the inadequacy of the uh, uh, of the schools and the teachers, like you said, through their online schooling. <laughs> and they're starting to see that firsthand, opposed to where before they drop their kids off at school, go to work, and there's that disconnect there. Well, now, since they're having to be involved in the um, in educating their, chi- uh, their children, they're starting to see how the curriculum isn't really serving them any purpose at all. So you're right, it's actually exposing more of the flaws of our educational system more than ever. And they're seeing, um, or they're making the argument to say, instead of our tax, tax dollars going towards paying for public schools, which we're not even able to utilize right now as a public service, but we're still continuing to have to pay for it. Hmm. Why can't we optional have the option to use the money that we are contributing towards a better educational uh, system or um, like you said, a voucher program? So it's, it's sad that taxpayers are finding themselves in like this catch 22 and our relying and we are out of time, Nicholas. I gotta help, hate to cut you off, but we are out of time. And thank you all for watching. You can join us at libertariancounterpoint.com. You can catch Nicholas at Wallstar2022.com. All right, well, I'll put a link in the description. Thank you all for watching. Thank Access Sacramento for having us on. Thanks, John and Nicholas, for being here. And please remember, love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday. At 8 p.m., Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.